Turn it on. Got to turn it on. I'm going to go ahead and get started. Okay. Okay. My mic is on and it will stay on. I'm start of mine on. Yeah. There you go. Ah, también. Okay. All right. We'll do. Thank you. Yes, of course. Hi. Oh, you're fine. We don't need a quorum to start a meeting, no? I don't think these meetings. The committees. I don't think the committee meetings. Just the board meetings. Okay. You can start. No, but they told me, give me five minutes because as I walked out, you know? How's everybody? Okay. Running to the restroom. I know. But yeah, the kids are out, right? We're in Mamus for a little bit. Okay, but Mamus. Wow. Soon, I know. Oh, my goodness. Wow. Non stop. That's good. Doing good, doing good. It's going right. It's already summer, you know. I was like, I... When is it? Y'all let me know if you want to go. She is. Oh, good. Good, good, good. Oh, yeah, that's going to be good. Well, whatever you need from me. Are you ready? Okay. It is uh, 5.35 and I'd like to call the uh, program and policy committee meeting to order. I'm gonna go ahead and begin with roll call. Uh, Jackie Levin Ramos is absent. She'll be here in a little bit. Erica Benavides Garcia here. Cindy Liendo, absent. Mercurio Martinez Jr. Present. Okay, we're ready to get started with number three, approval of Senate Bill 17 FY 2024 compliance certification, Dr. David V. Ariazola. Uh, I am uh, David Asola, Vice President of Compliance. Uh, <clears throat> we are uh, asking for the board to approve a compliance certification that is uh, required now uh, because of the passage of Senate Bill uh, 17. So last year, um, Texas Senate Bill 17 was uh, enacted. And basically what it does, it bans uh, what are called DEI offices. So any institution that had an office dedicated to uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, you know, had to they shut down that office and, and, and dismiss a lot of employees, right? Uh, luckily, we, we weren't among those. We do not did not have a, a DEI office here. But the bill uh, bans, uh, has a ban on any type of DEI office, also on any type of DEI initiative. Right, and um, also places restrictions on hiring, and, and by that, um, well, the expectation is that we don't 
place, say, if we're hiring, um, if we don't that we don't add points to a candidate that might fit a certain DEI type of description, right? Uh, also, uh, bans on um, training. We're not re required. We are not to require employees to complete DEI training. So as part of the Senate bill, um, it asked the board to certify that uh, none of our funding is going to DEI initiatives, that we're not doing any of the things that are banned by the bill. And, and what, two things that we've done as an institution to make sure that we can we comply with the mandates of Senate Bill 17 in February, uh, the board passed um, <clears throat> TASB update uh, 46. And within that update were all these policies, BG legal, BG local, BI legal, uh, CFE, DAA, DH, all of those had uh, were languages added to those policies to ensure that we were in compliance with Senate Bill 17. Internally as an administration, uh, during our spring in-service in January, we had a presentation uh, that we did to uh, the entire uh, college community, uh, advising them of some of the things that uh, we had to avoid in order to comply with uh, 2017. So the actual certification of compliance is in your packet. Uh, it has to be signed, uh, I believe, by the board president, um, but I feel comfortable that we we're in compliance with everything in there and and. The certification itself is complete. I believe it's only uh, pending signature. That's right correct, signature. but it, it will it will require board action. Okay. So uh, we wanted to bring it forward to committee uh, and then bring it before the, the full board on Thursday, but there, everyone has to attest that they've read this, that they acknowledge that we're not spending money to support anything that is DEI specific. Uh, we can, we can, you know, still provide all of our services. In our case, I think the blessing is that we're all the same, mm -hmm. uh, and so it 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 helps in in that. But um, the president does sign, the board chair does sign, and and we have a deadline of submission. Uh, uh, so we need. To take care the of the acknowledgement of it, yes, sir. If I may ask, where the college is involved in what areas within this? Where do Laredo College identify with any of these? In in everything, it, it, the the Every governor the governor has has, and and the legislature when they pass Senate Bill Seventeen, uh, it clearly states that there no ed, uh, education. Uh, institution of higher education is dedicating public funds to support diversity, equity, and inclusion. So if I may add as an example, some of the questions that have come in, probably the, the one of the bigger questions that has been so for cultural events, uh, things that we do like um, Cinco de Mayo, Cinco de Mayo. Cinco de Mayo or, or La Posada in, in during Christmas, right? So <clears throat> the, the, the law... The Senate bill doesn't say we can't have those. Uh, it just says we cannot have those exclusively for a certain protected class. So we can say uh, we're having an event that's only for, you know, say Hispanic Catholics, right? Um, we have to be open that up to everybody, which is are things that we already do. Anyway. So we we feel that we're our practices already comply uh, with the mandates of Senate Bill 17. We just had to put it in, in writing in, in some of our uh, policies. So now we no longer can get involved in any of these activities. We can, we can, we as can, long as, as long as we make it available to everybody. Mm -hmm. And for those activities, we use student fee funds anyway, mm -hmm. not state funds or public funds. So activities like that will happen. And if, and that's why I said in our case, it's a little different because everything we do is for everybody. It's not for a targeted group. So if we had, if we had an MLK event, mm -hmm. and we were only targeting a specific ethnicity or or race, that's a no no. That's a no no. We can't do that. We can't target a specific. As long as you group. invite the public, like, right? Everybody's. Which we always have, right? Guys? Yes. I have a question. Are you? Mr. Go ahead. I have a question. What about the federal funding that does require uh, stuff like that? How how is that going to affect us? 
Very uh, good question. Yeah. Very good question. I'll let Dr. Yasola answer. It, it, there are some um, okays with, with Senate Bill, and that's one of them uh, that is still sort of being mulled over even on the legal side okay. uh, about whether those que those funds violate uh, Senate Bill 17. Um, on our side, as far as funding, the only thing that we kind of have to review, that we had to go back and review was our scholarships, right? To make sure that our scholarships weren't being issued in a way that would violate Senate Bill 17. But uh, our federal funding uh, is in compliance. Perfect. Just curious. Okay, thank you. And we'll move on. Number four, affirm executive order number GA44 relating to addressing acts of anti-Semitism in institutions of higher education and approved modifications to local policies, um, DGC local employee rights and privileges, employee expression and use of college facilities, DH local, employee standards of conduct, FLA local, student rights and responsibilities, student expression and use of college facilities, FLB local, students' rights and responsibilities, student conduct, and GD local, community expression and the use of college facilities. Dr. David Ariazola. Hello again. Um, so it's, it's very ironic that we're, we're presenting these uh, back to back because uh, they almost seem in, in contrast. Uh, uh, the executive order by Governor Abbott uh, basically says we are um, we are to not allow any type of anti-Semitism protest, again, which there's an argument there that, that sort of goes against what was written in Senate Bill 17. Uh, we, we were very careful with what we put in our policies. So similar to what's being asked of Senate Bill 17, there is a uh, an affirmation or we have to reassure uh, the state that we're abiding by uh, what's being asked from us in um, the Executive Order 44. And, and the, these three things were taken directly from the Executive Order. This is what Governor Abbott is asking us to do, to review and update any free speech policies that address the sharp rights and anti-Semitic speech and acts on, on university campuses and establish appropriate punishments uh, to ensure that these policies are being enforced on campuses and that groups such as the Palestine Solidarity Committee and the Students for Justice in Palestine are disciplined for violating the policy, and to include the definition of anti-Semitism adopted by the state of Texas in 448.001 of the Texas Government Code in university free speech policies to guide university personnel and students on what constitutes anti-Semitic speech, right? So those are the three things that uh, we're being asked um, to um, to to affirm. Right. Okay. I'm, so, I'm sorry, Chair. I, I didn't mean to interrupt Dr. Adiasola. Whenever he's done, I'll just make a comment on this item. Okay. So there were um, there are five policies that are affected by um, by this uh, executive order. Right? There, I listed them there. The DGC local, which addresses the ex employee expressions. Um, DH local, which addresses employee standards of conduct. Uh, FLA um, addresses a student expression, FOB, students rights and responsibility and student conduct, and GD local, which uh, addresses community expression, right? And um, so we, with the help of uh, Mr. Muir and, and actually Dr. Ramirez, who provided some samples from, from colleagues across the state, uh, we were able to take what, what other institutions are doing. It took a long time to get that. Uh, usually when something like this happens, uh, institutions kind of put out what they're doing right away. But I we could tell that we weren't the only ones having trouble with uh, putting something together in our policy. But um, in a sense, what we did in DGC, FLA, and GD, we added the definition to anti-Semitism, the one that's recommended by uh, the executive order to all those policies. We also <laughs> revised any limitations on expressions uh, to apply to expressions that constitute uh, prohibited harassment. So it specifically says uh, uh, harassment based on anti-Semitism. Uh, in DH and FLA, uh, the two, the major revision to that had to be on the local policy that would add uh, to the list of prohibited activities, including the employee standards of conduct and then the student code of conduct, any engagement in anti-Semitic acts, 
or, or speech. Right? Um, this is a side note, uh, policy DH has also included in update 47. So we had to merge uh, what's in the next agenda item with what we're uh, changing here. So, um, <clears throat> but the actual changes are in your packet as far as uh, we added a couple of paragraphs here and there, nothing uh, major. Um, to comply with, with uh, the governor's order, but um, we feel confident that uh, based on, on the research that we've done that, that we should be in compliance with this executive order. I don't know, Rusty, if you want to add something here? Yes, if I may. Mm -hmm. Madam Chair, Dr. Amias, Mr. Martinez. So one way to look at this is it's a free speech policy issue versus no more DI, DEI offices. So there is, I agree with what Dr. Ariasola said, there seems to be some inconsistency there and there could be if you revise these policies in the wrong way. But but these policies, DH, DG, FLA, FLB and GD local, they're all free speech policies. And, and I was talking to this lawyer about you know how to modify these policies and he was saying, look, Rusty, take a look at that executive order that was signed by by Governor Abbott, it, it, parts of it are intentionally vague and it seems a little bit conflicting. And And he was trying to dance around the issue of not getting in trouble by favoring the Semites, I mean, you know, so uh, against these other groups. Right. And so the way these policies were modified is in, in such a way, yeah, you highlight anti-Semitism, but you don't create special rights to the exclusion of other races, other nationalities, gender, and so forth. And so, yeah, if you just look at those changes, that's kind of the, the general idea. And we, we try to be careful in doing that. And we want to add uh, one more uh, thing on this, on number two, where it says uh, that we have to ensure that these policies are being enforced. Um, so even though we added uh, some language to the employee code of conduct and the student code of conduct, I uh, just want to make sure that we've not had any issues with uh, any one of these groups, the Palestine Solidarity Committee or the Students for Justice in Palestine. Nothing on our campus, thankfully, uh, to where we've had to actually enact uh, any type of uh, discipline. We'll move on then to the TASB board policy update 47, review updated legal policies and act on local policies. Do I have to read them all? You know, I'm gonna read them all or, yes? Okay, CC local annual operating budget, CH local site management security, CS local information security, DBA local employment requirements and restrictions, credentials and records, DBB local, employment requirements and restrictions, medical examinations and communicable diseases, DC local employment practices, DH local, employee standards of conduct, DK local, professional development, DMC local, termination of employment, reduction in force, EBA local, alternate methods of instruction, distance education, GK local, Relations and Educational Accreditation Agencies. Dr. David B. Ariazola. Yes. So um, this is uh, TASB's latest update. Uh, as you know, TASB manages our policy manual and uh, twice a year, uh, they send out uh, updates to the local policy. The majority of the updates that you see in update 47 are being driven by two changes in administrative code. One um, is the revisions to uh, coordinating board rules that allow institutions now to select their own accreditor, right? So for years, the only accreditation that we could seek as an institution had to be from the Southern Association of Colleges and Schools Commission on Colleges from SAC CLC. Um, Several states uh, have have tried moving away from that. In Texas, it seems that the rule has changed to where we are allowed to switch. Uh, doesn't mean that we're going to, uh, 
uh, but we're allowed to seek accreditation from a different accreditor. And, and in some of the um, other policies, so that there is a list of about seven uh, accreditors that we could seek accreditation from. Uh, while I don't anticipate that we'll be changing anytime soon, uh, that option is always going to be available to us now, right? So well, what you see in a lot of these policy changes, you'll see the phrase uh, or title, I guess, uh, Southern Association of Colleges and Schools, Commission on Colleges, and scratched out and then replaced with a general, the college's accreditor, right? Uh, so that allows us, uh, you know, if we ever uh, do make a change in accreditor, we're gonna have to go back and change all these policies again. So the, the language has been generalized. So you'll see that in um, CC local, as well as in in some of the others. Uh, the other a change in administrative code that's driving many of these, again, different, uh, more on the law enforcement side, uh, is Texas Senate Bill 1445, which is again uh, enacted last year. Um, so that bill um, affects uh, pre-employment procedures for law enforcement. That says we have to do uh, thorough background checks through TCO. Uh, it also says that we have to uh, report to TICO any officer who has been um, uh, terminated with uh, due cause, and, and we have to uh, report to TICO that their license has been revoked. Uh, also, uh, changes to the standards of conduct specifically for law enforcement uh, um, officials and and. Uh, misconduct reporting and, and and so on and so forth, right? So a lot of the changes that you'll see uh, in relation to Senate Bill 1445 have to do with um, specifically law enforcement, not employees as in general, but specifically how we deal with uh, conduct for law enforcement, uh, you know, pre-hire uh, uh, teams, uh, also uh, fitness for duty, uh, uh, procedures and so on and so forth. So uh, won't affect the institution at, at, for the most part, except for law enforcement officials. Again, we go, we've, uh, Chief Hernandez and I have looked at a lot of these changes. Um, we are already complying with most of them. There might be a few things in here that we've already started to to address that, you know, if the board approves the policy on, on Thursday, then we'll kind of work on, on making sure we're in compliance. Thank you. Yes. Good. Okay. And and I do want to mention that it looks like TASB update 48 will be out next month. Correct. They're, they're already saying that it's going to come out next month. And so next month we may come back with alternative <laughs> changes. So I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> yes. The uh, Title IX specifically is going to be a major part of uh, update 48. Uh, one thing I want to make note of in... Um, the, the agenda item for update 47, uh, DH local, uh, which I've highlighted here, is already part of agenda item, uh, right, the right before the one affected by the governor's work. So uh, we would have to remove it from the update 47 because it's already gonna be voted on uh, when, we, when we vote on the changes for uh, the, the governor's work. So we would have to remove it from so that will do on Thursday. Would Someone would have to motion to remove DH local from this one or not vote at all on the previous agenda item for DH local. Right. Is so that correct? To... Either or. So one of them has that to be taken out. out. We can't vote on it this twice. Yeah. I, I suggest removing it from agenda item five because you've already got it over there mm -hmm. in that other. Uh, it's all it's part of i think the board packet in that section right yes sir yeah. that's where all the information in, is. I, item four mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. there is a it is different in item four and item five right because i the one in item four has uh the language for the executive order oh okay so uh miss elizabeth here saying it's already been deleted from uh the from thursday's agenda oh okay good so we should be good Okay, then let's move on to item number six, approve modifications to the following Laredo College Board policies, DCB Local employment, employment Practices Tenure, DJ Local Assignment Workload and Schedules, DMAA Local Term Contracts, Termination Mid-Contract, DMA Local 
term contracts, non-renewal, and DMB local, termination of employment tenure. Dr. Maricela Rodriguez-Tijerina and Mrs. Veronica Cárdenas. Maricela Rodriguez-Tijerina, Provost Vice President of Academic Affairs. So today we have actually uh, four out of the five. We're gonna defer DMB until next month so that we can take a more careful look at um, the termination processes. All of this is arising because of Senate Bill 18 um, that was um, approved by legislation last year. And um, do they have a copy of this, these uh, ones from the morning or they're up here? Because I have a copy. Okay. Dr. Pierina, which is the one that you're going to defer? Uh, DMB. DMB, the very last one? Yes. yes. Sir. Yeah, we'll bring it back. Tenure. Yes, we'll bring it back next month. Um, but I'm going to begin first with DCB. Um, this was uh, revised, and I met with Rusty and Memo, and, uh, and of course, Dr. Ramirez. And um, what we're proposing is based off of Senate Bill 18. And by the way, it's attached in the board packet at the end. So if you need to make reference to it, um, TASPI's not giving us di direction or, or we're, we're basically doing this um, based on what uh, the Senate bill reads, right? But um, basically what we're saying is that anybody who has been granted tenure as of September 2024, they're going to be grandfathered. So we're not taking away tenure from any employee that has already been granted tenure. If you notice um, the next paragraph, February 1st, 2023, the reason we have February 20, 2023 is because that was the last time we offered anybody at the college a tenure track position. We're going to honor their tenure track position, meaning that in five years from now, in 2028, that will be the last time that we'll come forward to give you all tenure recommendations. Okay. Then from beyond that, there won't be any tenure, which leads to the next paragraph that as of September 1st, 2023, which just happened in the fall, we are no longer offering uh, tenure uh, for at Laredo College. And then the tenure definitions are literally gathered from Senate Bill 18. And um, a lot of these modifications, the rest came about because recently I had, I met with a faculty evaluation committee and we revised our four major faculty instruments. And uh, so a lot of the verbiage here is to basically adhere to the revisions of the four instruments. And I named them instrument one is the classroom performance appraisal. Instrument two is the student evaluations. And the student evaluations were manda mandated by House Bill 2504. The instrument three is the personal, uh, professional and personal growth self-assessment. And then instrument four is a summary of all three instruments put together. So it's a very thorough process for, for faculty. Um, we also have a portfolio preparation. So anytime somebody's up for tenure, they have to adhere to that checklist. So when we present them to you all in February, they come with a very thorough evaluation process um, where they submit their portfolios and um, their chain of, uh, or their supervisors review um, these uh, portfolios. We remove the current uh, ratings because moving forward, all employees are going to be rated on these five ratings um, and uh, and including faculty. So uh, they start from unsatisfactory, needs improvement, meets expectations, surpasses expectations, and exceeds expectations. So now there will be five uh, if, ratings. If I might interject mm -hmm. here something, I think the key point here is one, the faculty worked on their on these five their their four instruments the difference between faculty and staff is that faculty have four evaluation instruments annually whereas staff get one evaluation instrument a year and so the only reason this situation this we're in this situation of doing away with tenure is because of the Senate bill that was passed in the last legislative session, 
that is really dictatorial in how we're supposed to proceed. And so the faculty working with Dr. Tijerina and her and Dr. Hernandez and their team are coming up with their own solutions to their own to this situation that we're in. So we're not going to tell them how are we going to do this? They helped together, they revised this plan. And and that was the only way to do it so that everybody could feel comfortable. So I, I just wanted to preempt that. They've done a year's work on this. So it's a lot of work and and it's been a it's been grueling for them, but it needed to be done. So and uh, again, uh, as we continue, is is basically to adhere to the current practice of moving forward with these. I don't want to say new instruments, but revised uh, instruments um, to also adhere with what today's teaching and learning is about. A lot of these instruments were a little outdated. Um, so needless to say, we have classroom appraisals. And as Dr. Ramirez mentioned, not only does their department chair evaluate them, but also their dean. So there's uh, when when somebody's up for tenure track, the dean also goes in. And at any point, there's always discretion that their supervisors can go into the classroom at any time to evaluate. Uh, I do have a question. Yes, sir. When you mentioned the dean, uh, who, uh, since he is one of the bosses, if, if I may make that term, uh, who are the ones that evaluate then the dean? Uh, would other faculty members would do that, or, or what would be the breakdown of the evaluation committee? So the the deans are. Your question is the, who evaluates the deans? That is correct. Right? The the provost. And what? I'm sorry. The provost, me. The provost. The provost. Yeah, okay. in July, and then now with the recent reorganization. Eriberto, Dr. Hernandez will evaluate the Dean of the Community Education and the Dean of Workforce Education. Of course, with a with me overseeing all of that as well, but uh, but that's who the the deans. Now, I will say that the chairs and directors, they're evaluated by these four instruments to adhere to the faculty role. But then in July, we do the evaluation based on their administration role. So uh, because, you know, sometimes and and it hasn't happened in, in my years as, as provost, right? But maybe somebody may not perform to the level expected as chair and director. That doesn't eliminate that individual from being an employee at the college. They just go back to faculty. So that that's uh, what's stipulated in the in the procedure manual for the faculty. So um, there's descriptions, like I said, on each of the instruments. And then if you notice, there was a lot of striking out of um, page five and page six, because what we're doing is we're removing librarians and counselors from the faculty category. So now they'll be going through the exempt um, um, role, exempt staff. Um, and uh, anybody who has been offered a tenure track, let's say as a librarian, they will still be given the opportunity to go through the tenure process, even though they won't be part of the faculty ranks, if that makes sense. But they will have to adhere to all of the requirements of post-tenure review. Correct. Eventually, so I mean, there, 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 there's, there's a lot of discussion in in the ranks that why would somebody be able to acquire tenure if they're not being evaluated like faculty? It does. It's not fair, right? If faculty are expected to do all these things to get tenure, then shouldn't everybody else adhere to the same responsibilities? And I think there was a time when staff members were also faculty members and therefore were granted tenure. But we have some folks that are on tenure that haven't taught a class in 20 years. Wow. So so we're trying to, especially now because Senate Bill 18 is really cracking down on all of this stuff, we're, we're trying to be as fair as we can with everyone. And so there's a there's a whole process that we've had to, Eliminate. So they don't get um, evaluated the same way 
but how do they get evaluated? They get evaluated, the librarians and the counselors yes. get evaluated like the rest of the exempt um, employees right. in July. Mm -hmm. what, by July 31st, their evaluation. By instrument? I mean, right. by. Mm -hmm. okay. may, may I ask also, how, how can uh, somebody, one of our, our employees, were part of the faculty and yet have not been teaching for over 20 years, uh, and yet they were faculty instructors? How does that apply? So the counselors back in the day were added into the tenure um, oh, okay. scenario because they used to teach what was called a student success course. Oh. And that was a teaching course. When we eliminated that out of curriculum, then they're no longer teaching okay. uh, that you. course. So ideally in the past, that's how counselors got into, were yeah, were able to. And librarians... The same thing because of some of the teaching that they do with the databases, they should be working with the faculty on on doing library orientations on what kind of resources. So that's how that part came about and granting librarians um, the faculty ranks and and getting or receiving the opportunities to obtain tenure. Okay. So we're done with, with that. Yes, at the end, um, nothing again really changed other than updating the ratings um, and putting into practice what, or explaining what we actually do into practice. At the very end, to adhere to Senate Bill 18, we have a section called post-tenure guidelines. And these post-tenure guidelines, it's part of the agenda later on, and I have a copy uh, once I'm done with the these policies. Um, again, Senate Bill 18 indicates that whoever's tenure out of institutions, they have to go through a comprehensive uh, evaluation process. So this includes administrators like myself, mm -hmm. uh, counselors, librarians, teaching faculty, anybody who has gained tenure, they have to go through a post-tenure uh, review. And in that post-tenure review, I've been working with the same committee. We have a seven-page document. It's a in, in draft version. Um, we're not ready to have the board approve it tonight, but I want you all to take it with you because next month, we hope to gain approval by the board um, because this will be something important that we need to um, launch starting September when the faculty returns from from um, uh, after consultation. Okay. And uh, so the post tenure guidelines, comprehensive guidelines, are recommended by the college president and approved by the board of trustees. So post tenure guidelines will include everything basically mentioned on page 10 and 11 is coming from Senate Bill 18. Okay. Um, and one of the things I'll probably recommend is that we, on the side, I had put post-tenure guidelines. I think I want to adhere to the same language that Senate Bill 18, and I'm just recommending that we put post-tenure comprehensive evaluation because they keep using those terms. Those are like the key terms for a comprehensive evaluation. So that's DCB local. So again, to adhere to Senate Bill 18, to remove librarians and counselors from the faculty category, and um, to basically adhere to the new instruments and the new practices that we have with the new ratings. So. Okay. Any questions with DCB? I don't have any questions, Mr. Martinez. Okay, then we'll move on to number seven, post tenure review update. Let's kind of... Be before we do that, uh, I'd like to also acknowledge the presence of uh, of uh, Ms. the member of the board. Thank Mr. you, sir. Jack 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 okay. He sneaked in. <laughs> Thank we'll you, make sir. Make it a matter of record. Thank yes. you. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. sir. Uh, post-tenure review update, Dr. Marisana rodriguez Tijerina. DJ local policy, all it is is due to the the reorganization, the recent reorganization, we're revising Ms. Um, Cardenas' title 
from senior to executive director of human resources. Um, I think that was, yeah, that was the essence of DJ local. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so it's something very minor. And then the next policy DMAA is discharging of faculty members. Now the recommendation again is to remove counselors and librarians from the faculty members. Um, so that's where you see them um, being deleted here. And um, and that goes for the for some of the verbiage in this particular um, policy. And revising um, Ms. Cardenas' title. And then lastly is DMAB, again, revising titles. And DMB, as mentioned earlier, we're going to defer it till next month. We'll move on then again yeah. to post tenure review update. Dr. Marisela Rodriguez de Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. So before you is, uh, it's fresh off the press because I literally met with the evaluation committee uh, and I want to commend the faculty because they're off contract and they're still meeting. Uh, we have a group of what, 10 Eriberto, that are very committed uh, into this. So we have currently seven pages of introduction, the purpose of why we're doing this. And to sum it up, basically now anybody granted tenure, we're gonna to have to submit a portfolio and that portfolio is gonna to have to go first to a peer committee of tenured faculty that is gonna review the evidence. There's three major areas that they're going to review. One is teaching excellence. The second is service to the community college and department. And lastly is professional development. So in that portfolio, the peer committee is just going to evaluate the evidence. Is there substantial evidence that they are adhering to those three major areas? Then once they clear that checklist, then it's going to go to the chair, the dean, the associate provost, and myself. And then from there, the supervisors will determine, if you look on page three, there's no deficiencies. There's unsubstantial deficiencies. In other words, there's some things that are lack, lacking, but not enough to place the faculty or the tenured employee on an improvement plan. When there are substantial deficiencies, then that individual will be placed on a professional development plan. And that's part of Senate Bill 18, that we place them on, a, on an improvement plan should they need one and give them ample time to, to work on those uh, improvements. Um, there's a timeline in the back on page seven also, and um, on page uh, six, so anytime going back to that improvement plan, what's important as stipulated in Senate Bill 18 is that we provide specific dates, benchmarks, tangible goals, um, the appropriate support that the tenured employee needs in order to try to help them improve from, from that, um, or those deficiencies, rather. Now, I ask the question, so what happens if I retire in a year, I don't want to go through this portfolio, just, that's fine, we just need a written notification from the employee at that point, when they don't want to go through this process, then they forfeit their tenure status. They forfeit? Yeah. The tenure status. Yeah. The tenure. Those that are already in tenure. I'm sorry? Those that are already in tenure, right? Right. They want to retire. Is that what you well, said? Well, let's or say I retire in a year. I don't want to go through this lengthy process. Right. Uh, I'm still going to get evaluated by those instruments that we just right. went over, DCB local, but I don't want to submit a portfolio. So all I need to do is submit a written notification to the provost and the president saying, I don't want to go through this post tenure. I don't want to submit a portfolio. Then at that point, they lose their tenure uh, because they're requesting it, not because we took Here it you. away from them. 
but let's say that they're um, they're on the track, right? They haven't been chosen yet, so they're on tenure track. They're on tenure track. Well, mm -hmm. well, they're they're already tenured, but then all of a sudden this comes up, and they're like, okay, so so you're like, either you're either on tenure track. Uh -huh or you're already tenured. Right. And if you're already tenured and you choose not to do this, then you could for you forfeit your tenure, your tenure, your tenure. If you're on tenure track and you choose not to do this, you will still be evaluated, mm -hmm. but you lose your tenure track status. Right. Okay. So for both, for both, um, for both categories, mm -hmm. but let's say, um, okay. So let's say I'm that person and I had no idea that I wanted to retire, but you know, I'm so I'm keeping quiet because I'm not on that cycle yet to be evaluated, right? Because like I think we're gonna do it by cycle. sections, right? Yes. And then all of a sudden comes to that time. I, I don't know if I'm gonna retire in a year or two years or whatever, but then as soon as I, I know that I'm up for evaluation, I can tell you, you know what, I don't want to, and then I lose it right then and there, right? Or I can retire and not make so let's say uh -huh. I'm supposed to go up for review in year three, but I'm retiring this year. Yeah. You don't lose your tenure because you're retiring. At that you time. know, right. Okay. Uh, if you notice on page two, the reason it's highlighted is because I'm working with human resources to get a whole list. Uh, right now, I only have the list of tenured faculty, but I know there's administrators, there's counselors that are not under my supervision. So what we're going to do is line up all, list all the tenured employees and then average or make equal cohorts, right? So let's say we have 160 mm -hmm. and we're going to, as Ms. Ramos was saying, we're going to divide them by cohort. So anybody from 1974 to 2008 will be placed in a cohort okay. and they're going to be randomly selected by the years that, that we can I guess make them equal mm -hmm. and then from there they'll get a notice when they return from convocation you're up for post tenure not this year but next year or and it it just depends where they land kind of so, like what they do at school right right like it's a lottery yes, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. an electronic lottery so that it's fair to yes. everybody yeah the only difference at our sc at, at school is that uh, I think they put you on on a list, and if you were evaluated this year, you don't get evaluated until three years later, or something like that. So, or you get observations or things like that. But I mean, I I don't know exactly the whole complex part because they choose the teachers uh, by random, I think, mm -hmm. or those that have already been evaluated, and the new ones, you know, they they stagger them. But yeah, I and I, that'll happen here too, mm -hmm. Ms. Ramos. So good. so once they get on a particular post tenure review track, mm -hmm. they won't be that if they get evaluated, let's say in 2026, then it, they won't get post tenure reviewed again until 2029 Three years or later. 30. I think the recommendation is to we we can do it no less than one year and not more than six. I think the recommendation is every six years. One like more. Because the law allows that. Not but again, than, not to say that they're not, not going to get evaluated one. by the instruments, right? right? right. No, because, uh, yeah. It's, for post tenure, but they still get evaluated every year. Right. Right. So, and the other stipulation that they came on the committee, I mean, the faculty uh, mentioned is that we're not moving anybody forward in this post tenure if, let's say, they have a needs improvement or they haven't met the needs expectations or higher on their instruments, right? Um, then at that point, they'll be placed on a professional development plan. And until they get out of that plan, then they're eligible. And that's what the first paragraph says. They're el eligible to then begin the process because it doesn't make sense for somebody to go through this process when they're on a needs improvement right. plan. Is there any way that just for uh, statistical purposes, um, how many people are on uh, tenured right. and then how many people are on uh, track. track? So for faculty, and this is where I'm pending um, yeah, that's what I was like saying. everything from HR, right? Because there's, as I mentioned earlier, there's administrators, there's uh, the counselors. I think um, for faculty only, teaching faculty, that is, we have 111 
tenured faculty. Mm -hmm. So about half. Mm -hmm. And total total faculty? About 178. Don't quote me the numbers. That doesn't include adjuncts. Right. Yeah, just or the dual adjuncts. Those are just full timers. And on track. I'm sorry. Uh, on the tenure track, I want to say I saw something along the lines in the 20s. Do you remember it? 20, 22, I think 20. 20. Yeah, I think they're like 23. Yeah, they're like 20s. Yeah. And then but this I, I can not, bring the numbers if, or I can, on, I can send them to Elizabeth. This doesn't count again, administration. So, um, some and I think with administration, it's very little. But some administrators were teachers before for faculty? Yeah. Okay. Those are the like, ones that, like yeah. you, Craig, like me, like uh -huh. Fred, like David, mm -hmm. Eddie okay. Okay. And they will have to go through the same process. So either they start teaching or so I'm gonna ask another question. Uh so when it comes to service, what does I know service towards the college or so service towards like within the college or like what is the definition of service? So if you look on page four, this is just for the portfolio. I'm not referencing the instrument for because the instrument for we do have um when we talk about service, there's three components of service. The service you do to the community, the service you do for the college, and the service you do for the, your department. Okay. Uh, so if you notice on page four, those are the the examples that, um, that we're listing so that faculty can include in their portfolio as supporting evidence of their service to, let's say, the community. And then there's a list of service to the college. Um, and then there's a list of service to the department. And then professional development includes? They Basically. could give a lecture at a conference. They could mm -hmm. give a presentation on a panel. They could be, you know, any. Maybe he's trying to pursue it. And and this I will say, um, I know Dr. Fred's working with the counselors to add their respective evidence because these bullets that you see here on page four, mm -hmm. they're geared towards teaching uh, faculty. A lot of them as administrators, we fall like, for instance, new programs. I mean, in the past four years, I think we've brought in eight new programs, you know, and every new program is like a 400 page proposal right so we're i know david check yeah Eduardo, myself you know there's a lot of things in here that we're currently doing not necessarily that we need to be providing evidence of us teaching in the classroom it's it's just what strong evidence can we provide that we're adhering to what teaching excellence is you know um and um so I'm getting the perspective of the librarians too. Um, and I got some good feedback. So I wanna make sure, so that's why this is not ready to be approved because I'm still collecting the evidence uh, as far as what librarians can bring to the table, what yeah. counselors, and so that way it's a fair game um, in, in this post tenure. So right now, well, if they're already tenured, what's gonna happen to them? So they're gonna, be placed in a cohort, like on page two. Uh -huh. And then from there, whenever their time comes, okay. that's when they have to submit that portfolio. Okay. What happens to the people? Cause like, this is real interesting. You know, those three different categories. What happens for, okay, you have faculty that's uh, tenured and then tenure track. Uh, what happens with the others that are not, neither one of those two? Like, if there, are there any any faculty that are neither tenured nor tenure track? Yeah. yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. So will they still be judged, a bit, I mean, uh, evaluated like this? They won't need to submit a portfolio. So let's say I got hired by the, by the college two years ago, but on a non-tenure track. They don't have to go through this process, but they still have to go through DCB local where their four instruments are going to take place. Like, Which are these? 
uh, and DCB, like DCB. instrument one is the classroom appraisals. Okay. The instrument two is the student evaluations. Instrument three is a, a reflection of their professional growth. And then instrument four is a summary. That's on page um, two. And it goes on. David's going to dust off his old calculators and start teaching again. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. That's. She has it. Okay. So annual evaluations are for everybody. Right? For everybody. Yes. Okay. Regardless of positioning. It's the tenure track have the portfolio and require these three areas. And so the, the, the regular four instrument evaluation for faculty is different from the one instrument evaluation for staff mm -hmm. exempt or non-exempt they get one instrument uh faculty still have their four instruments because they still have to keep up with their program or their at their subject matter specialty and so they still have that extra added responsibility so something to think about, I mean, I just, uh, I'm a, a forward thinker. <laughs> um, what happens when there's no more tenure, right? What happens when there's no more tenure track? Can you adjust the policy so that Service. those that are neither in those categories, right? Let's say we get to the point, I'm saying like 10, 15, 20 years from now, get to the point where we don't have anybody on those two categories. We only have faculty members right mm -hmm. that we that we consider at least having uh, them be evaluated mm -hmm. like teaching service a uh, teaching excellent service and professional development as part of their well I mean again I'm thinking like way ahead of the game right but I'm just thinking because I would hate for them to not meet the criteria that the individuals met because of their word tenure right tenure and and tenure track they're meeting this criteria where they're having to fill a portfolio, get everything ready and stuff like that. But maybe for the future, think about how we can adjust the uh, the policy for those individuals that are in either categories. So just for a point of clarification, instrument four already requires them to do all this, do all whether this. they're okay. tenured or non-tenured. Okay. Uh, here, the difference is just, I'm creating a portfolio with a narrative of, of examples. So if I say I'm a board member for housing authority, mm -hmm. okay, prove it, right? It show us what what works or or what's your agenda. How do you prove that you were appointed? You know, yeah, uh, you're, you're providing the yes, supporting yes, documentation. Yes. Uh, I think from the website. Right. Yeah. yeah. So so you're adding all this to your portfolio of of this big comprehensive. Um, um it's like a show show right. i want to show off what i i've done right and right. you you prepare it in a narrative right we used to do that a long time ago right like uh, we used to do our binders yes remember? yes <laughs> we should do our binders <laughs> every year yes it's a, well it's we're not doing binders anymore <laughs> we're gonna do canvas uh uploads Perfect. Uh, so we're going to create their shells and then from, because everybody, why Canvas? Because everybody works with Canvas. And I think it's a lot easier to upload all the supporting evidence than us carrying these binders yeah. Yeah, around is. campus, you know. Does Canvas work similar to Google? Mm, yeah. Like the folders and stuff like that? Yeah, I, I think Canvas is easier to use. It's more intuitive. Uh -huh. Um. I think it's probably the best version of an online course shell. Okay. Um, because the Google Classroom is more, you gotta create folders for every single thing, and and I think over here it's a little more. It's I think it's just a little more intuitive, mm -hmm. but that I've used Blackboard and Google Classroom and Canvas. Mm -hmm. What I've learned while I've been here, this is my first exposure to Canvas. Okay. And and I think it's easier to learn. And it's easier to use. And you put it, your your documents we, in there. So what we're going to do is create like a master shell where module one is teaching excellence. Yes. Module two is uh, the service. Module three is the professional development. 
So no modifications in that. All you, they're going to be doing is uploading their narratives and and they're supporting documentation yeah. right there just to make it easy. I think that's a really good idea because uh, I created a couple of uh, folders for the modules for the principles and uh, and they were all digital. So then all they had to do was look at the folders. The directors would look at the folders and say, okay, this did they meet this one and this criteria and so forth. And it was real easy because then uh, the... The evaluation form or the checklist mm -hmm. was also included there in that folder that belonged to a teacher or b teacher or whatever so or in this case it was a principal and so, the course and, and the, the the shell can be opened up as early as we choose so mm -hmm. that throughout the year as things are happening you can be you uploading start, things yes, yes. so that you're not at, at the, the very end trying to find everything and yes. put everything in the right place mm -hmm. yeah that's so. a good idea and then since you're going to even uh, even have it open for people that are not going to be evaluated within that cohort, just so that they can continue mm -hmm. to start stories. Yeah, stuff. they can have access. That's a very good um Because you'll forget point. after, yeah. say, like about the year afterwards. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, I'm on the list. Ah, let me start getting back no, on. I don't yes. remember from yesterday to today. <laughs> yes, yes. Okay. yes. yes. Okay, no, that's just, a good, good idea. Good that. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a yeah. good point. But I definitely wanted to share what we've been working on. Um, but next month, you'll have the final draft um, that the board uh, uh, would have to approve. Um, and um, and then we just launch it starting convocation when the faculty gets back. I wanted to ask you a question. If I If you have an employee that is moving from one college where they were tenured, uh, in the state of Texas, can can they come and work here and still be tenured? Only if we hire them that way. Only if you hire them that. If way. we don't hire them on a tenure track, no. No. Okay. Right. But this policy is saying so. To answer your question, we never had it in the policy of let's say they come from Alamo and they had tenured there. We never honored that. The only way we honored is if they had tenure before here at Laredo College they left and came back, then instead of going through the five years, I think we gave them two years, uh, uh, two years, right? It's in DCB local, but I scratched it out because what we're saying now with DCB is that moving forward, there's no more tenure. Right. Um, we're grandfathering the ones that do and that are on tenure track, but moving forward, September of 2023, we stop offering tenure positions. At the university level, most um upper administrators were hired on uh, already tenured provosts presidents um uh, though those would be if they were coming from an institution that where they were tenured they were typically honored for the tenure for the tenure as as provost or president and if i may add on the ranks we're going to have to revise because tenure was was stipulated to in order to move up from instructor to associate um, di um associate professor and assistant direct i mean professor assistant. and professor you have to obtain obtain tenure if we keep tenure there then no there's no point in having ranks so the recommendation of, of faculty is to remove that tenure component for now and and that will the help ranks. the ranks keep going, you know. Um, so on the faculty procedure manual, that's one of the changes that we're we're going to make. And I'll probably bring the manual uh, for informational basis uh, in August. Okay. Do you think we need to adjust? I mean, besides adjusting that, remember we spoke about the ranks about mm -hmm. three years ago. That's when we start setting setting them up, right? I mean, we've been talking about it for like ten years, probably. But then all of a sudden we were able to get, you know, a good solid um, criteria for, mm -hmm. for that. Mm -hmm. And so that would be one of the things that you would eliminate and then make, what will we add or what would we continue to keep? All we need to do is remove the tenure component uh -huh. uh, from, the, from the instructor to the assistant. That's all they want is tenure not to be tied anymore to the ranks. So, and I would take it a step further and say that some of those promotions should be either tied to additional certifications or additional degrees mm -hmm. and therefore additional funding to their salaries should be added. Yeah. So mm -hmm. if an individual is moving to an associate professor, 
because they they were able to obtain a master's degree, I think our salary should reflect that. Right. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking at Mr. Vella. Sorry, Mr. Vella, but I, <laughs> I mean, if we're expecting our faculty to continue to grow, then I think we need to grow with them. And well, the, what about tenure? Does it, no compensation? No, right? There's no compensation. Now, I will say faculty is the only category when when we talk about money is when they get a degree advancement. So let's say I have a master's, I obtain a, a doctorate in the teaching field. Then they, if you look at TASB, whenever it's presented with a budget, mm -hmm. they move on to the next category and there is a pay um, yeah. increase. So there is pay salary increases with level advancement. So they get the next level of, of their attainment, educational attainment. They do, it is tied to salary. They're and the they, only employees on campus that we do that. Fact. Mm -hmm. I, I, have, I do have a question. What about a faculty member that already has a, a master's degree and then goes on and gets another master's degree in another field? Is there proper compensation? Other than, mm -hmm. I know there's compensation when you get your doctorate, obviously. But what about it? Do we have anything in that in that? Uh, we uh, don't, Mr. Martinez. But I will say that contingent on their master on their second masters, they may be eligible to be adjuncts in another department, and then there they get compensated for that additional class that they teach. So I don't want to say that it's not a benefit. I think it is because if they're able to teach in another department as yeah, adults, that's an additional uh, salary increase that comes in. Thank you. Well, I would, I wouldn't get that. Well, I did. I got two. <laughs> so I mean, but I, I, as an educator, I would recommend to anybody saying, "I think I'm going to do a second master's." I'd say, "Just go do your doctorate. Why are you going to get another master's?" That that would be my suggestion as an as an advisor. I think it works for some, but others, like in my case, I have a library science and a public administration. So public administration is library science. Library science is not public administration. So, but I, I'm neither here in that concentration. It could have been in uh, library science or, you know, or it just depends on the person and what the purpose of it is to do it. But the compensation shouldn't come from that particular position that they hold, right? Because they already have supposedly a master's, right? Yes. In that department. Well, well not all, right? Not because all. Uh, some workforce programs, they're, we hire them with a certification depending on sure. on their discipline. Really, when it comes to faculty, it's, it's based on the expertise of the discipline they're going to they're teach. Going to. You know, like, like my master's, my master's personally, would not be applicable, let's say, if I were to teach organizational leadership. My doctorate is applicable to my to the organizational leadership program. Mm -hmm. uh, for me to teach biology, my master's is sufficient. Especially. You know, so it, it just depends again what discipline mm -hmm. um, they're going to be teaching. Yes. Very good. Good conversation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Anything else? Any other questions? Okay. Then we are adjourned. Thank you all it's, very much. So, uh, what time is it? It is six forty. Six forty. Thank you. Thank you all very much for all your hard work. Your little, your little thing. <laughs> I didn't even do it. Stand adjourned. Yes. Meeting adjourned. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much mm -hmm. for helping. Thank you.